We are all called to perfect union and communion with God, and that's what heaven is. And if my interior is not perfected and one with Christ, I can't yet go to heaven. So there has to be a place um, in a state where we can be purified of self, where we can let God love us, where we could surrender with our own will to God's mercy that he granted us in this life, okay? So God can forgive us all, but I got to receive that mercy. And in some of the private revelations that I read regarding purgatory, a lot of people are in purgatory because God is so generous with his mercy, but we don't receive it because we can't fathom the great goodness of God. So we keep God at a distance. Even though we're forgiven because we've asked, but God is still at a distance. So purgatory, a lot of times, is a, it's, it's a place where you're obviously, you can't sin anymore when you're in purgatory, and you're going to go to heaven. We know that, right? We're all going to, if you're in purgatory, you're going to heaven. And purgatory is different than hell. You know, purgatory is a safe place which God has given for all of those who haven't perfectly become one with him on earth, right? And so purgatory is a safe place. In hell, it's torment, it's hatred, it's absence of God's love. It's total hatred, it's total cursing God, it's total rejection of God. And one person attacks the other, the other person attacks, everyone's attacking everyone in hell. It's total absence of God, that's why it's called hell. And, and, and I think it's important that we understand, like, you know, even the darkest, deepest levels of purgatory are different than hell, okay? And often you'll hear imagery of purgatory being, like some mystics say there's a mist, and some will speak of the fire there. And I had a quote here from St. Faustina, actually, in one of her, her visions of, of purgatory. And she says, I saw my guardian angel who ordered me to follow him. In a moment, I was in, the mi in a misty place full of fire in which there was great crowds of suffering souls. They were praying fervently but to no avail for themselves. Only we can come to their aid. The flames which were burning them did not touch me at all. My guardian angel did not leave me for an instant. I asked these souls what their greatest suffering was. They answered me in one voice. That their greatest torment was longing for God. Praise God. Sorry. That's right, you're right. He's calling. It's the Lord. <laughs> Tell him we said hi. It's one of my blessings. It says, they answered me in one voice that their greatest torment was longing for God. I saw Our Lady visiting the souls in purgatory. The souls, were, the souls called her the star of the sea. She brings them refreshment. I wanted to talk with them some more, but my guardian angel beckoned me to leave. We went out of that prison of suffering. I heard an interior voice which said, My mercy does not want this, but justice demands it. Since that time, I am in closer communion with the suffering souls of purgatory. Okay, so that line which Jesus says is important. Let's talk a moment about that. My mercy does not want this, but justice demands it. Think about that. Mercy and justice. These are always th two things that are important. Right? God's mercy is that He Himself became man to give to the Father what we couldn't give to the Father. The Father deserves perfect love. Nobody can give the Father perfect love except Christ Himself. So, an offense against perfect love requires an infinite reparation. Right? If I offend infinite love, I have to repair with infinite love, if I'm just. So all of us basically are doomed unless somebody can come up with infinite love. And so God's mercy is God becomes man to pay for what we can. Infinite love becomes man, takes on human nature. Infinite love gives back to the Father, on our behalf, infinite love. And so, Jesus, you know, paid the price. He purchased us all at a great price. So when you were baptized, you were given what Christ won for you, particularly on the cross. So each one of us at baptism are given the free 
unmerited favor, the grace and gift of God, to enter into a relationship with the Father through the Son by the power of the Spirit. Like, we can't earn that. There's no way we can merit that. That's a gift, okay? So, my mercy doesn't want this, but my justice demands it. What does this mean? Jesus is saying this about purgatory. What does that mean? My mercy doesn't want purgatory, but my justice demands it. So, God doesn't, in His mercy, want purgatory. But His justice demands it. Meaning what? Meaning, you can't go to heaven until you're perfectly, your whole human constitution is perfectly united with God. And that means every intention that we have is pure. Like, everything I do, I do for the glory and love of God. You know, AMDG, right? Everything I do, I do for the glory of God. When that starts to happen, then I'm becoming holier and holier, okay? And so, so, so in purgatory, the Lord is doing what? He's, it's, a, it's an act of mercy. Purgatory is an act of mercy. Because if there wasn't a purgatory, my brothers and sisters, the problem is this. You and I might be forgiven, but if we're not perfected in God's grace, if we die of unrepented sin, even venial sin, and we, 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 we have sin on our soul, <coughs> we can't go to heaven. So if you're not perfectly one with God, you're going to hell. That's, that's what it would be without purgatory. Unless we lower the bar of heaven. If we lower the bar of heaven, then we can eliminate purgatory. But if we keep the bar high, and we hold heaven to be what heaven truly is, the understanding that we have of heaven, which is holiness through and through, every thought, word, and desire is totally consumed with the love and passion for God. I totally forget myself. Totally like, like the Lord on the cross. You know? Totally serving the Father. Totally pure heart. That's why when you read the Gospels, yeah, we're reading about Jesus, but guess what? We're reading about how we're called to let Jesus continue His mission through us. You know, forgiving our enemy. Jesus from the crucifix, from the cross, He forgives. And so, every time we forgive, we're mystically on that cross with Him. We're living Christ crucified. Every time I... I, I speak a kind word to somebody. I'm letting Christ love through my lips. Every time I listen to somebody I don't maybe want to listen to or don't want to waste time with. If I use my ears, I'm letting Jesus use my ears. We're the body of Christ, right? Every time I use my hands to glorify God or my feet, you know, just walking over here. I don't walk here, I drove it. <laughs> walking into the building. You know, um, smiling. Looking at you, loving you, inviting you closer to God. I'm letting Jesus, it's not me up here, it's Jesus through me calling you and inviting you to ponder the beautiful doctrine of purgatory and to think about what does purgatory mean? Why is there a purgatory? So purgatory is a place of mercy. It's God's mercy. His mercy doesn't want purgatory because what is he saying? He's like, well, if everyone would perfectly receive my love, we wouldn't need a purgatory. But God goes, if you want, an extra step and says, He's factoring in our human stubbornness. He's factoring in our, our limitations, our frailties, our, our inability to receive Him perfectly. Okay? And so, you know, you might think, well, where are you? Where do you fall on the scale? You know, where are you in your journey of holiness? Really, only God can, can really know our hearts. We, we don't even know ourselves very well. And this is one of the reasons there's confusion with purgatory is we cheapen heaven and then we think, oh, everyone's just going to go to heaven. Or everyone dies. God loves everyone. Why would God have a purgatory? People that are in purgatory, at least the private revelation in the mystics that I've read, those who go to purgatory are excited to go to purgatory. We shouldn't. Everyone tells me we shouldn't aim for purgatory, right? <laughs> if you aim for purgatory, you might miss and hit hell, right? 
So you want to aim for heaven, and if you shoot a little low, you'll at least get to purgatory. <laughs> so we want to aim for heaven, right? But, but the Lord wants us to understand that those who, when they die at the moment of death, and they have been forgiven of all serious sin, there can't, if you die in mortal sin, you can't go to heaven or purgatory. You, you go to hell. But if you've been forgiven of mortal sin, serious sin, and you have, you know, say, unrepented venial sins or, or need for having sins to repair, you have to have reparation for your sins, atonement for your sins, expiation for your sins. And see, some will argue, well, Jesus did all that on the cross. But see, you're thinking, we're thinking as man thinks. The high dignity of the Christian is that we share in what he did on the cross. So, I, in my heart, in my soul, in my mind, all of my life cannot be seen apart from Christ crucified or Christ's life. So when I die, if there's parts of me that like, no, I'm, I'm here and then Jesus is here, I'm not in communion with him. So if I really understand this, I understand that I'm touching Jesus here. I'm looking at Jesus. This is the truth. I'm looking at Jesus, and you're looking at Jesus. And if we surrender to that truth, and, and, and begin to have a childlike approach to life, and, and really understand that everyone we meet is Jesus, inviting us to love and communion. So we might say, well, where am I in communion with God? How do I know if I'm in communion with God? How do you love your enemy? You love God as much as you love the person you love the least. That always hit me hard when I heard that. Like, you love God as much as you love the person you love the least. That's a hard thing to hear, but that's the truth. Because, see, it, it just shows you how warped our understanding of love is. Like, we only love what we like. I love pizza, I love beer, I love iPads, I love phones. I, mean, I love this, I love that. It's like, God's love is different. And we're talking about that agape love, right? Sacrificial love. God's divine charity love in the soul. In the soul. Right? And, and so how much do you know if you're in communion with God? Well, how much do you love? Because love allows communion with God. Well, where did I see you, Jesus? I don't know where you are. Where are you, Jesus? I haven't seen you, Jesus. You know, when I was hungry, did you feed me? When I was naked, did you clothe me? When I was a stranger, did you visit me? Or sick, did you visit me in the prisons? You know, the corporal and spiritual works of mercy. That's how we know how much we love God. That's a, the, Matthew 25. That's a great examination of conscience. To see where am I in my communion with God right now? How am I growing in holiness? And where am I falling short in holiness? Okay? So think about that. Because again, right now we're beginning. God doesn't want us to wait. Oh, I'll be in prayer to That would be cool. No. Shoot for heaven. Like I want to become one with him now. And, and it starts with believing and trusting. Okay, Jesus, I believe I'm your body. I believe I'm looking at your body. I believe that I'm touching your body, that I'm holding your body, that I'm beholding your body, that you're beholding the body of Christ here. I'm beholding the body of Christ there. It's surrendering to that truth. It doesn't matter if you understand all of this. Your understanding doesn't change reality. Which is how our world thinks, right? If I don't understand it, then it must not be true. So, so the Lord's saying to you and I, this is the church's teaching. We are the body of Christ by grace, not by nature, right? What he is by nature, we are by grace. So he by nature is the son of God. We by grace are sons and daughters of God. Free gift. Nothing to buy here. You can pay for that. There's nothing to pay for. It's all paid for. It's done. It's a free gift been given to you at baptism. Okay? And so, so this idea of purgatory comes with a good understanding of the interior life and what holiness is, what communion is, what relationship is with God, which can't be separated from my relationship with my neighbor. Okay? So a woman has an abortion. She's forgiven. She's in purgatory. What's going on there in that moment? Well, some of the mystics that I've read in, in 
and I've seen this is the woman in purgatory who had the abortion. She's been forgiven of her sin because she's asked to be forgiven of her sin. But she's in purgatory right now. What is she doing in purgatory? She's asking God to forgive her, to forgive all those she's hurt, to atone and pray for all those she's hurt through her abortion. See, because when you're in purgatory, you're in the light of God. So you understand. Like, let's say, is it Teresa? Say, let's, say, let's say I said, you know, Teresa, you're dumb. Mm -hmm. no, I'm just joking. You know. But like, let's say I said that to her. And she takes it into her heart, and she starts believing that. She touches someone because of the lie I told her. Then they touch someone, and they touch someone. Imagine 10,000 years of that lie going down. And how many people it destroyed or affected. See, we don't think like that now. I say one mean thing and I think it ends right here. No, it goes thousands of years. And then it spreads out and fingers out into thousands of ripples. So the smallest venial sin ripples out and divides and destroys the beauty of humanity. In purgatory, I see that. Why do you think purgatory might be a little painful? Well, if you see the effects of your sin, you are hurting because what you realize is how much you've hurt not just the people but I hurt Jesus not just Teresa Jesus is right here I crucified Jesus I start coming into an awareness of all this like in heaven again in purgatory nothing's hidden from us we see it we understand it we yearn for union with God we, those in purgatory yearn like, like St. Faustina said they they, they thirst for God, union with God. But they realize how they chose through their sin to separate themselves from that union. It would be like somebody giving you a free gift and you rejecting it. And then you realizing that that was your cure. And you flushed it. You know, imagine if somebody here, you have a terminal illness, somebody comes up to you and says, I have the cure, and you're like, yeah, right, whatever, get out of my face, I had a bad day. And then you realize that you just pushed away the person that could cure you and help you and heal you, okay? So, so you can kind of see the woman in purgatory that had the abortion, she's forgiven, but she's working now to repair the damage that she did that that baby would have brought all of those graces and goodness to thousands and thousands of people for thousands and thousands of years. Because I might live, say, 70, 80 years, but my life goes way beyond me because I influence a lot of people. And that's what they'll even say, like a lot of the mystics I've read as saints, is those are, there's a ton of priests and bishops and, and religious in purgatory and in the darkest parts of purgatory. Because they're responsible for teaching garbage or hurting people's interior and spiritual life, right? So, those in purgatory, those in purgatory are repairing through their prayers. They can't pray for themselves. At least that's what we, we've, I've read and that's what I've learned. They can't pray for themselves, but they can pray for us. They can pray for others. Again, they're learning to love. They're being purged of selfishness. And what's, if you think about what's happening in purgatory, God's pressing closer. Can you, can you just come up here? Tree? She's my prop. Right? <laughs> Beautiful prop. So, so let's say she's in purgatory right now. And she, she at least some of the mystics I read is, each, each soul in purgatory has their time with, with the Lord. The Lord is working with them. She sees all of her sins. She's aware of the effects of all of her sins. She's in pain because the fire that we often hear talked about in purgatory or the mist, it's the light of God. It's, it's the brilliance of God. It, it hurts because she sees her choices and all of her effects. And so the Lord in purgatory, this is again just analogically to kind of maybe help us is the Lord's pressing closer to her. He wants 
to embrace her. He wants perfect communion with her. But she sees all the damage she did. And in her own will, she has to yield to the generosity of Jesus who wants to say, yes, you did all that. And yes, I still love you. Her mind is it's incomprehensible. How could this be? I see this huge, vast destruction that I've done with my choices. And yet this Jesus wants to embrace me. And, and I can embrace her like this, but... That's different than she letting me into her heart. Right? You can hug all kind of people here, but there's a difference in hugging someone and really embracing someone's heart as they are. And again, this is back to the interior. So purgatory is God working with the interior of every soul. Or I guess there aren't bodies in, in purgatory, right? It's just our, our souls, because our soul leaves the body at death. And, and so the souls in purgatory, the human souls in purgatory... Or in this purification process. God is, God is pressing closer to her. He's burning up the, the fears and the lies that she holds on to. Because remember, Jesus can't force her to let go of anything. Because we have a free will. See, if you don't factor the free will in, well sure, we die, we all go to heaven. But God can't force my will to become one with his will. What's God's will for, for, for Teresa? What's God's will? <laughs> what's God's will for her his will for her is to be one with her but he can't force her to accept him and when you're seeing all of your sins and God's close to you it's painful because you realize that you just hurt him and so she is now slowly as we pray for her as the church in heaven on earth, as we pray for her, she can't pray for herself. She's praying for all those she hurt. Jesus is pressing closer to her to help her to receive his love, his, his communion with her. And his love for her is burning up all of the lies or misconceptions or limitations that she holds in her mind and heart. And as the Lord gets closer to her, and as she surrenders to God's love, she slowly gets closer and closer to heaven. So she moves through the stages of purgatory as she prays in charity for all those she hurt, as she surrenders to the merciful love of God. And then she gets to the point where she's ready to go to heaven. She's now cleansed, purified, healed. She's now ready for heaven. Now she can experience heaven as heaven intends her to experience heaven, as the Lord wants her to have heaven. See, let's say, you know, she's like an empty vessel here, and she's about this full of herself, and she's got that much emptiness. She's got Jesus from here to here. But from here down to her feet, she's full of her sin and herself in a sense of she hasn't really embraced the Lord in those areas. God has to empty her, purge her, purify her of all of self. Then when she goes to heaven, her whole being can be illuminated by the presence of God. If you think about all of this and you think about, you know, how amazing it is that there's a purgatory and how blessed we are to have a place where we can be healed and brought into full communion with God. Okay? And again, what makes purgatory make sense? Two things. The understanding of what heaven truly is and the free will, the human will. If heaven's perfect communion with God, you can't force someone to be in perfect communion with God. So when you die, if you're not in communion with God, guess what? You're not going to be in communion with God when you die. You don't just magically become one with God when you die. That would eliminate the free will. The free will has to yield to the love and communion of God as he invites Teresa into communion and purgatory. And as she prays, she's becoming more like Christ because she's praying and loving through her prayer. As we pray for her, we're becoming more like Christ. And she moves quicker through her purification as we pray and love her through it because we're all part of the same body of Christ. And so just, just ask the Lord for, for light, for understanding of, of this beautiful teaching. So we know purgatory exists. It's a place of purification for those who died imperfectly purified and need further purification after death 
Um, the purification of purgatory is entirely different from the punishment of hell. Um, and we need to help the souls in purgatory by prayers, especially offering the holy sacrifice of the Mass um, for these souls. So again, there's a difference between the, the forgiveness of our guilt because of our sin and the punishment or reparation required to atone for the sins we've committed. Okay? Um, and there's scriptures, um, if you want to write some of them down, um, that you might be able to chew on a little later. Um, I gave you a few, but um, the one that talks about the difference between this, you know, serious sin and venial sin, um, 1 John 5, 16 and 17, um, 1, or James 1, 14 and 15, talks about the differences between you know, mortal sin or venial sin. Um, and that's important because, right, mortal sin is death of God's life in me. James what? Uh, James 1, 14 to 15. And 1 John 5, 16 to 17. talks about mortal sin, venial sin, the difference between deadly sin and sin that's not deadly. Um, you know, and this is just a little quote from a gentleman in here. He's not even Catholic, um, but they put him in here, so I'm going to read it. I think it's a great quote. It's, um, his name is... Um, James Boswell, this is from 1769, he said, Why, sir, why, sir, I gotta say it right, <laughs> not why, sir, why, sir, it is a very harmless doctrine. They are of the opinion that the generality of mankind are neither so obstinately wicked as to deserve everlasting punishment, nor so good as to merit being admitted into heaven. Therefore, that God is graciously pleased to allow a middle state where they may be purified by certain degrees of suffering. You see, there's nothing unreasonable in this. Good insight, James. <laughs> C.S. Lewis, he says, O oh, souls demand purgatory, don't they? Would it not break the heart if God said to us, It is true, my son, that your breath smells... Your rags drip with mud and slime. But we are charitable here in heaven. And no one will get angry with you about these things. Nor draw away from you. Enter into your heavenly joy. Should we not say in reply, with submission, sir, and if there is no objection, I'd rather be clean first. It may hurt, you know. Even so, please. So his point is, is you want to be clean. You want to be perfect. You want to be purified. We got to be perfect as our Father's perfect. So you know they're just kind of making the arguments there. So just one other point, and we're going to have some Q and A. Um, one other point I'd like to make is something God gave to me in my own prayer. Um, this idea of a lot of us think that we can at the last moment, or maybe not of us here. Hey, Steph. Hey, sorry. <laughs> A lot of us think that, you know, maybe um, the, the world thinks that, you know, I'll, I'll decide at the last minute that I can, Jesus, I want to accept you. And I'm not saying that's not possible, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't roll the dice in that direction, right? <laughs> this is how I want you to think about this. Have you all, I'm sure everyone here has had the experience of being in a movie theater, and coming out into the bright sunlight. And your eyes burn or they hurt because it's so bright. <laughs> this is the experience of death. When we leave our bodies, our souls are in the brilliance of God's light. What's the temptation when you move from a life of darkness to a brilliant light? You want to go back to the darkest place you can find. And, and it's important, like think of a bat. If there were bats in this room, they'd find the darkest corners of the room to hide. <coughs> and so when we are brought into the glory and presence of God at the moment of death, if we haven't begun to adjust to God's light now, that moment will be too painful and we will choose where we were comfortable before we died, which is darkness. And so we want to begin to adjust to the light now. As you, you know, walk out at the movie theater from a life of, if you will, say, the movie theater represents an immoral, dark, vice-filled life. Outside the movie theater in the bright sunlight represents a life of virtue and holiness. 
there's no like most most I mean God can do whatever he wants but when we God's giving us this time on earth to begin to adjust now to the bright light of his presence so that when we die and leave our bodies and are before him we'll be some level of already adjusted to his brilliant love and light his selfless pure love but if I've gotten used to a, a vice-filled, immoral life now, and I'm living in that darkness spiritually now, when I die and leave my body, the spiritual reality that I'm living becomes very apparent and present to me. I will flee the light out of pain. Souls aren't told to go to hell. Souls choose hell because the light is too painful. They'd rather flee to the darkness. It's hard for us. It's hard for me to imagine, but. That's what happens. No one, God sends no one to hell. We choose where we want to be by the way we live our lives in love or not love. And so I want you to keep that in mind is that, that now on earth is our time to adjust to the light of God. See, those in purgatory are finishing up their adjusting to the brightness of God's glory. They're not ready for heaven yet. It's, it would still be too painful to go to heaven for those in purgatory. Because they haven't been totally transparent. They're, to, they're still being emptied. They're still being purified of self. They're not yet totally one with God. Well, when you finish your purification, you can look into the sun and experience its beauty, its glory, its splendor. And so, you can kind of keep that image kind of helps me at least to maybe grasp a little more of what is purgatory and why is it there in, in heaven and its brilliance? Um, and, and, that, and this is another thing. is The Lord said, why are you uncomfortable in silence before the Blessed Sacrament? Well, what are you in a rush, Father, for? Well, Michael, why are you so hurried to get done praying? Well, Lord, because your love is so pure. I'm uncomfortable with it. This is why we don't like silence. Because... God's loving us with his unconditional love and we're like fidgeting and like I gotta read this I gotta hurry up get my mind off being still I gotta do this I gotta do that in my, my holy hours I gotta, I gotta do all this stuff and the Lord's like why are you so uncomfortable with the way I love you? And so again we can begin our purgatory now by sitting in front of the Blessed Sacrament and being quiet by praying the rosary. What is the rosary? It's Our Lady teaching us how to receive the light. How to be one with the light. How to embrace He is the light of the world. Jesus, right? One with Jesus. Right? Our guardian angel. Please don't um, let your guardian angel be bored, alright? <laughs> keep, keep your angel busy. So daily prayer, preferably for the blessed sacrament. Frequent confession, right? It's a purging, a purifying of self. Um, frequent Mass and Holy Communion, obviously. Uh, uh, regular penances, some form of self-denial, atoning for our sins. Fasting from, you know, desserts, television, giving more charitably to others. Um, daily Rosary, as I said. Um, offering up your death. It's a beautiful thing to think about. Offer up your death and everything you'll go through at that moment. You're going to go through it anyhow, so you might as well use it right. Yeah, don't waste it. <laughs> offer up every moment of your death. Uh, offer up your whole life. Please do the morning offering. Morning offering is uniting everything you do. Think thoughts, words, doings, every step I take, every breath I take, every beat of my heart. Lord, I unite to you through the Immaculate Heart of Mary in union with the Mass offered throughout the world in reparation for my sins and all of the sins of the world. Do the morning offerings. Um, or offerings. Um, offering up your daily crosses and burdens for the poor souls in purgatory. Um, the sacrament of anointing. If you're, if you're really sick, have a priest anoint you. Um, and then indulgences. We don't have time to talk about all the indulgences. But the indulgences are the, it's the church's treasury of grace, which Christ won through the saints, through him, through his sacrifice. See, you and I can store up grace. Like, let's say... This is a day's worth of, this is my holy hour. God filled this up. And God's like, thanks, Michael. He goes over here a thousand years later. What's your name? Lisa. He's like, Lisa needs some love. <laughs> <laughs> and then God brings it back to me the next day and it's empty. He's like, 
I need another holy hour. He fills it up again. Then he's like, maybe goes a hundred years ahead to Caitlin. Caitlin needs a conversion. Then he comes back with the empty vessel. He's like, come on. That's... Angels are like, yay, I love this. This is fun. He's like, fill it up again. Fill it up again. See, this is how we got to look at life. This is how we got to look at life. This is how we do our purgatory. Now, this is how we learn to love now. Is God keeps filling up the, the, the graces. Our angels are holding these out. And they're like, you know, they don't have no one to dump grace on. They want to dump grace on somebody. So let your angel be an instrument of God's grace, a, a messenger of God's grace. So when you're doing your holy hour, um, send your angel out frequently to dump those graces on all those people, right? And it's a beautiful way to think about your life. You know, you're driving and you're frustrated because just not going like you want with traffic. All right, we'll cash in. Make a spiritual investment. Don't waste that. It's a treasure. God will, you could fill up a whole box of these. And you could send out angels in every direction to dump this grace on the people that need it. And perhaps you could refresh the souls in purgatory with this, right? And that's part of the beauty is it's refreshing the souls in purgatory, okay? So, the, the treasury of the, of the church, the indulgences, we, we can, through our acts of love and charity, God will build up this treasury and use it as he wishes and sees fit to save as many souls as possible.